Well, amen, and good evening. I hope that you're doing well today. I'd like to welcome you to our Deeper Wednesday Bible study here at New Beginnings Church. This is a time every week where we gather together to hear from God's word. I firmly believe that God is still speaking. He's still speaking through his word, and I believe that he has a word for us today. And so I'm so excited to, to get it, get started as we are in this warm spring day. I hope that you're enjoying it if you're here in Florida. But let's go ahead and take a moment out of our busy weeks. I, I don't know about you, but it's already been a busy week for me. Got a lot going on. But why don't we just take a few moments and begin to open our hearts and our minds to God. And let's cry out to the Lord in prayer. So wherever you are, I want to encourage you to just take a moment, close your eyes. Now, if you're driving, keep them open. But whatever you are doing, just take a moment and allow your heart to just focus and concentrate on the Lord. Why don't, why don't we do that for just a few seconds? Just allow yourself to begin to experience the goodness and the presence of God. God is wherever you are. He is present with you. Maybe you're listening and you're at work right now. God is right there with you on the job. Maybe you are getting your kids ready for dinner and for bed. God is with you in your house right now. Maybe you're on the road and you're headed somewhere. God is right there in the car with you. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, know that God's presence is with you. Just begin to let that presence minister to you. I feel the power of God this morning or this evening. Feel the Lord's presence. Let's go ahead and pray this evening. God, first of all, we worship you. Lord, we sing our own song to you, lifting up your name. Lord, we have come into the house and into this moment so that we can bless your name. God, we just, we want to just take a moment right now and we want to proclaim that you are good, that there's no one like you. God, we can search all over. We can look all around the world. We can look all over the place, and we will never find anyone like you. Lord, you are awesome. Lord, there is no one like you. And so, God, we worship you this evening. Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, God, we worship you because you are worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. God, we join with the elders and the angels around the throne, and we say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. God, we lift up praises to you because all the praises are due to your name. God, we lift up our hands and surrender to you because at the end of the day, Lord, all we can do is bless your name. And Lord, we could bless your name for a thousand years and we would still have more praises to sing. God, we praise and we worship you this evening. For you are holy and you are good. Why don't you just, wherever you are right now, just take a moment and begin to worship the Lord in your own way. Maybe you need to clap your hands. Maybe you need to shout hallelujah. Maybe you just need to get down on your knees for a moment and thank God for everything that he's done for you. But wherever you are right now, why don't you just take a moment to worship the Lord? Because there is no one like him. God, I just, I'm, I just take a moment and I worship you, God. Lord, I want to lift up my voice, lift up my hands. Lord, I want to lift up my life to you and worship you, God. Lord, we bow humbly at your throne this evening. Oh, Lord, we love you. We worship you, God. We adore you, God. Lord, we also come before you as people who are broken. Lord, you see us in our sin. 
You see us in our shortcomings. Lord, in so many ways, we drift from who you have called us to be. Lord, we sometimes make choices that aren't good for us. God, sometimes we make choices that destroy those things that you intend for us to have. But God, we thank you that this evening you have forgiven us, that Lord, your grace that is more than we could ever imagine has been poured out on us. And so Lord, we thank you that we are forgiven, that Lord, you have done the work to reconnect us to you, that Lord, even though we were a ship without a sail, God, you have pulled us back in, God, and you have anchored us in your goodness. God, you've reached down into the mari clay, and you've pulled us up, God, and you've set our feet on the solid ground. So, Lord, we say thank you for saving us this evening. God, thank you for saving us and reconnecting us with you. Lord, thank you for sanctification and the way in which you not only save us, but God, you clean us right up. God, you clean us up and you set us right on the way. Lord, you order our steps and you begin to call out of us more than we could ever see in ourselves. And Lord, we thank you that you keep moving in our lives, that daily, God, your spirit empowers us to live for you. Lord, we worship you and we thank you, God, that you've forgiven us and that you have saved us. Why don't you just for a moment, thank God for your salvation. Thank God that you've been saved, that you have a new life, that you're a new creation in him. Amen. So glad to be saved this evening. Lord, we also come before you as a thankful people this evening. Lord, the first thing that we thank you for is for guiding us. Lord, thank you for being the one who is the light in our world. Lord, thank you for being the one who orders our steps. Lord, we realize that on our own, we would just get lost. But Lord, you have found us and you guide us. So Lord, we thank you for your guidance this evening. We thank you for the way in which you direct our steps into your perfect will. Lord, we pray that you would continue to guide us. Lord, we pray that we would continue to be sensitive to your voice and for your desires for our life. Lord, thank you for guiding us. Lord, we also say thank you for speaking truth into our lives. Lord, as we prepare to turn our, our, our eyes and our hearts towards your word, we thank you for the scriptures and your inspired word. Lord, we thank you that you have given us a perfect guide to how you want us to live. God, thank you for continuing to guide us and to speak to us. Lord, thank you for telling us the truth about the world and the truth about ourselves and the truth about the future that you have for us. Lord, I thank you that there is hope and joy in your truth. God, we also thank you for creation. Thank you for putting us in a world where we have everything that we need to live. Lord, thank you for the community that you put us in, the neighborhood that we live in. Lord, thank you for the place that you have us and the time in which you have us in, God. Lord, finally, we also thank you for making all things right. God, I know that it's easy when we turn on the news to just see all the problems in the world. Those are real problems, God. But I also know from the bottom of my heart that those are real problems that you are solving that those are real problems that your spirit is empowering women and men of faith to address. Lord, I know that even though it looks like there's a problem in the world that might not be able to be solvable, Lord, I know that you are the God who can make a way out of no way. Lord, I know that you are the God who makes the impossible possible. And so, Lord, I thank you that there is hope in the world because the world still belongs to you. And Lord, we come before you with needs this evening. God, we pray for those who are in need of healing, that you would heal their bodies in Jesus' name. God, those who are in need of healing uh, for mental illness, Lord, those who are experiencing a broken heart, 
we pray that you would bring wholeness to them and that they would experience the completeness that can only come from you. God, we pray for those who are grieving this evening. We especially remember the family of our beloved Deacon Cameron as they mourn the loss of their aunt. We also pray for all those who have lost somebody or are walking through a time that just causes them to mourn. We pray that they would experience the peace that comes straight from heaven. God, we pray that you would meet all of our needs. I want to just pause for a moment. If you have a need, I just want you to begin to think about that need. Maybe you need the Lord to help you get a new job. Maybe you need the Lord to help you when it comes to one of your children. Maybe there's something that only you know that you need. I want you just to begin to think of that need. And as a sign of offering it up to God, I just want you to, to symbolically stick out your hand like this. And I want you just to lift it up to heaven as a sign that you are lifting up your needs to God Almighty. God, we lift up all of our needs, every deficit that we're facing, every challenging moment that we're walking through, every difficult season. Lord, I pray that you would have your way in every single situation. That, Lord, we would be blessed even as we face things that we don't understand and that we would see you moving. God, finally, we pray for this church family. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful things that you've done here at New Beginnings Church this year. God, we thank you for our friends who have come and visited. God, we thank you for the work that you have accomplished. God, I pray that you would move us into a new season, a season where people are being drawn here to hear the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. That, Lord, this would be a house of prayer for all people. That, Lord, we would see salvations. That we would see people baptized in the Holy Spirit. That we would see people sanctified and healed. That, Lord, this would be a place where we encounter the divine miraculous. God, I pray that you would continue to use this church for everything that you've called us to do. God, as we turn our eyes, our hearts, and our souls towards your word, I pray that you would speak this evening. I pray that this would not just be a midweek ritual, but Lord, this would be a time that we come expecting to hear from you. We pray all these things in the wonderful name of Jesus, the only name that can save. Amen and amen. All righty, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. We are continuing our study on the Declaration of Faith. Tonight, we are going to be studying the second part of the 12th article of the Declaration of Faith. So as a little bit of an introduction, the Declaration of Faith is our church's statement of faith. It lists out the basic pieces of what we believe, what we believe about God and what we believe about what God is doing in our lives. So by studying the Declaration of Faith, hopefully we come away understanding what it is we believe as a church family, but also I hope that it changes our understanding of what God is doing in our lives personally. And then finally, I believe that by understanding what it is we believe, hopefully it can cause us and encourage us or maybe even inspire us to live differently in the world. I don't think we just need to know the right thing, but we need to live the right thing. And so we are going to look at the second article, I'm sorry, the, the 12th article of, of the Declaration of Faith, and we're going to look at the second part of that. We started last week looking at the 12th article, which deals with, first of all, the Lord's Supper. And now we are going to be looking at the second part of that that deals with the washing of the saints' feet, what we'll call in a more simplified way, foot washing. So if you are watching at home, you will hear the audio from our Declaration of Faith video over the audio. If you're here in person, you can turn your eyes to the screen, and then we're going to jump right into the Word. The Declaration of Faith. 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 
The Church of God believes the whole Bible to be completely and equally inspired, and that it is the written Word of God. The Church of God has adopted the following Declaration of Faith as its standard and official expression of its doctrine. We believe in the verbal inspiration of the Bible. In one God eternally existing in three persons, namely the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of the Father, conceived of the Holy Ghost, and born of the Virgin Mary. That Jesus was crucified, buried, and raised from the dead. That he ascended to heaven and is today at the right hand of the Father as the intercessor. That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that repentance is commanded of God for all. And necessary for forgiveness of sins. That justification, regeneration, and the new birth are wrought by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. In sanctification, subsequent to the new birth, through faith in the blood of Christ, through the Word, and by the Holy Ghost. Holiness to be God's standard of living for His people. In the baptism with the Holy Ghost. Subsequent to a clean heart. In speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. And that it is the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In water baptism by immersion. And all who repent should be baptized. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Divine healing is provided for all in the atonement. In the Lord's Supper and washing of the saints' feet. In the premillennial second coming of Jesus. First, to resurrect the righteous, dead, and to catch away the living saints to him in the air. Second, to reign on the earth a thousand years. In the bodily resurrection. Eternal life for the righteous. An eternal punishment for the wicked. All right, so let's go ahead and jump in. So I want to go ahead and give an illustration as a way of giving us a starting point for our discussion this evening. So one of the things that we probably have all seen a politician do on TV is go to a local restaurant and serve in the kitchen or serve as a waiter and it's always interesting to see people's reactions when they see their mayor or their governor or even the president of the United States serving them food and serving them at the counter or even being back in the kitchen on the grill. It's this moment where people are in shock because their leader is serving them, doing something that maybe they wouldn't really expect someone in that position to do. I kind of think of the one time I was watching on the news that President Obama at the time had gone into a McDonald's, I think it was, and was working the counter. And people are walking in on their lunch break, handing over their money, ordering, and all of a sudden they recognize that the President of the United States is serving them their Big Mac. And they just have this moment. You can see it in each of their faces where they're recognizing, wow, the, the President of the United States is serving me. I'm not worthy. What is going on? So that might be a more comical example from life that we've all seen or perhaps we've witnessed. But I think that that kind of is what is experienced when we think about foot washing or the washing of the saints' feet. Something that happens near the end of Jesus' earthly ministry on the same night as the Lord's Supper is he, he washes the disciples' feet. And the disciples kind of have that same reaction that people do when they're at McDonald's and their, their local politician is working the counter. It is one of shock. But I think that foot washing um, is is an important thing for us to consider, and it's an important part of our faith in the church of God because it tells us something about what God does for us, and it also tells us something about what we are to do for others. So um, let's go ahead and dig into the, the 12th article of our faith, the second part, which talks about the washing of the saints' feet or foot washing. So let me read the, the 12th article to you. 
it says this, Our church believes in the Lord's Supper and the washing of the saints' feet. Let me read that again. Our church believes in the Lord's Supper and the washing of the saints' feet. So last week we talked about the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, we can think of that as a memorial meal that celebrates and remembers Jesus' sacrifice for you and I. It is a moment where we regularly gather together to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for you and I. The second part of our article deals with the washing of the saints' feet, foot washing. Um, Here's how this might look like in one of our local Church of God congregations. Uh, People um, will have a bucket of water and they will generally, often on the Sundays when they are taking communion, they will gather around and they will wash one another's feet. They'll take turns washing each other's feet. The church that I came out of in Lakeland, we had a foot washing ceremony one time on a Wednesday night, and our church uh, separated men and women into different groups, and we washed one another's feet. It was a powerful, powerful service. Uh, I remember it. In fact, as a young minister, I got to wash the feet of one of our senior bishops. And then what shocked me is that after I was done washing his feet, he said, now I'm going to wash your feet. Now, Bishop George Wilson, who also pastored this church decades ago, um, at the time was in his late, he was in his uh, mid to late 90s. And uh, at this point, he was walking with a cane, but I was shocked when he got down on his knees and washed my feet. It was a powerful moment. So the reason that we participate in foot washing is it's a symbolic act to remind us of what Jesus has done for us and what Jesus calls us to do for others. So in our church, we have three symbolic ceremonies that we have that are meant to remind us of what Jesus has done for us. So we've already talked about water baptism. When you go and you get dunked by your pastor in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, that symbolizes you dying to your old ways of doing things, just as Jesus died and went into the grave. And then when you get brought up out of that water and you're soaking wet and you take that first breath, that represents you being resurrected into a new life. Now you are you're taking that first breath into a whole new way of living. Just as Jesus was raised from the dead, now you've been raised from the dead. So that's water baptism. The other symbolic ceremony that we do is the Lord's Supper that we talked about last week. The third one is foot washing or the washing of the saints' feet, where we in the church, we wash each other's feet as a sign of what Jesus has done for us and what we are called to do for others. So during today's Bible study, we are going to focus on the role of foot washing and the role of that practice in the life of believers. Now, admittedly, many of our churches don't really practice foot washing anymore. Uh, Hopefully here at NBC, it will be a practice that we begin to implement more because it's a powerful symbol of what Jesus has done for us and what he calls us to do for others. So, why do we practice foot washing? Why do we practice foot washing? Now, this is, is, in my opinion, an important question because we're living in 2024. Most of us don't have anybody washing our feet. We take care of personal hygiene on our own. We don't have anybody washing our feet. So why is it that we would practice this thing that seems completely out of place in our world and in our daily lives? So our church practices foot washing because it is connected to the Lord's Supper. Um, We're going to look at John chapter 13 in a moment, which is where we get the information about foot washing but what we see is that in, in John 13, during the Lord's Supper, actually just before the Lord's Supper, 
uh, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. So our church believes that foot washing has a special connection to the Lord's Supper. That's part of the reason that we practice it and that we do it. So a little bit more information. So on the night before that, that Jesus served the first Lord's Supper, he also washed the disciples' feet and encouraged them. He didn't command them in exactly the same way that he did uh, where he commanded them to do water baptism and he commanded them to do the Lord's Supper. But he encouraged the disciples to do the, to do likewise. He said, just as I'm washing your feet, I encourage you to wash each other's feet. So the main reason that we do foot washing is because Jesus washed the disciples' feet right before he served them the first Lord's Supper. And so there's a close connection between the Lord's Supper and foot washing, but also because Jesus encouraged his disciples to go and do likewise, to wash each other's feet and continue to do this. And so rather than commanding them in the exact same way that he did with water baptism and the Lord's Supper, Jesus encourages his disciples to do this because it is a good thing. So let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles and look at John 13. So if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and look at John 13. And let, let's go ahead and read verses 1 through um, 17. So John 13, verses 1 through 17. So here's what the word of the Lord says. It was just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. So let me pause there and give you some background information about what's going on. So at this point in Jesus' ministry, he's preached, there's been miracles. There's also people who are not so happy with him because they see him as a rule breaker. They see him as someone who's just there to cause a problem. And there are people who are planning on killing him. So Jesus has made a turn towards the cross. His death is not that far off, and he knows it. His disciples don't quite understand what's happening, but Jesus understands what's going on. And so he's preparing to go to the cross, to die, to be resurrected. And we know that after his resurrection, he goes back into heaven. So that's where we're at. This is before all of that happens. Continuing on in verse 2. The evening meal was being served, and the devil was already prompt, had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus Christ. Jesus knew the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took, his, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin... And he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So, let me pause there. So, this would not have been a strange thing in the ancient Middle Eastern culture that Jesus is living in. Let's, let's keep in mind, wasn't like Polk County in 2024, paved roads, sidewalks. Uh, they didn't have Air Jordans or Skechers, they didn't have shoes like we did. And so if you had been outside all day, walking to and from work, uh, going out to the temple, doing what you do, going out to the market to purchase food, by the end of the day, when you got to the dinner time meal, your feet were dirty. Your feet were covered in dirt and whatever else was in the roads that you were walking in. So it was not unusual in this culture for the servants of the house to wash the feet of the guests who had come for dinner and everyone else there. It was a servant's job. This was a normal thing. This was as normal as washing your hands before a meal like we might do today. So Jesus takes the position of a servant and he begins to wash his disciples' feet. Now, we're going to talk about this in a minute, but this is very important for understanding what is going on. 
Jesus is doing something that his disciples didn't think was was his job. They thought that that was below Jesus. Jesus is the last person that they would expect to be washing some dirty feet. He was the teacher. He was the rabbi. They weren't expecting him to get on the ground and clean some dirty, disgusting feet. The disciples would have been shocked by this. But this is what Jesus is doing. He's washing some disciples' feet. Continue on in verse 6. Jesus came to Simon Peter, who's one of the disciples, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus responded, unless I wash you, you will have no part in me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. So really interesting conversation between Jesus and Simon Peter. There were a few of those that occurred in John. But Jesus goes to wash Simon Peter's feet. And Simon Peter is like, wait, whoa, whoa, bro. What are you doing? This isn't your job. And Jesus says, oh, no. I'm going to do this. You're not going to understand right now. You will later. And Simon Peter's like, nope, not happening. And Jesus says, if you don't allow me to wash your feet, you can have no part in me. You cannot, you cannot, you're, you're not, you're not on team Jesus at that point. And Simon Peter decides to allow Jesus to wash his feet. And he's like, okay, well, don't just wash my feet then. Just, just go ahead and drop the whole jar of water on me. Just clean me up. Interesting dialogue. Jesus answers Simon Peter and says, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. So Jesus, in a a way, tells everyone in the room, hey, not everyone in here is necessarily on Team Jesus. One of you is not so for Team Jesus. This would have been Judas Iscariot that he was referring to. Continuing on um, in verse 12, it says that when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Jesus said, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Let me read that again, because that is actually a really, really important verse for why we in our church wash each other's feet, and why we practice this special ceremony. I'm going to go back to verse 14. It says this, Now that I, your Lord and your teacher, someone who's over you, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Jesus is saying, if I'm truly your teacher, truly your Lord, truly the one that you follow after, if I'm truly your example for how to do things and how to do life, then you need to go and do what I did, and you should be washing each other's feet. You guys should be getting right down here and and washing some dirty feet because that is what I did, even though I'm your Lord and I'm your teacher. I, I need you to do like I did. So Jesus is saying, if I'm truly your Lord, if I'm truly your teacher, and you mean that, and you're truly following me, you need to be washing one another's feet. Here's the key in verse 15. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, You will be blessed if you do them. One more time, verse 17. 
Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. It's really important how that passage ends, because Jesus is making the point that if I can do these things, you too should do these things. If I can take the position of the servant and do a dirty job, you also should be willing to take the place of a servant and do a servant's job. So this is going to be really key as we look into why are we practicing this strange ceremony of foot washing? What exactly is the point? So one of the things that I want us to get as we're talking about why do we practice foot washing is this. We must understand that as believers, the Holy Spirit empowers you and I to follow after the example of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior who has saved us. This is part of the reason why we are to wash one another's feet is because the Holy Spirit is empowering you and I to follow after Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian. Being a Christian does not just mean having membership in a church. Being a Christian does not mean that you just post some verses on your TikTok or your Facebook profile a few times a week. Being a Christian truly means that you are one who follows Christ. That's what Christian means. It means Christ follower, one who follows Christ. Foot washing, in one way, is a reflection of the desire that each of us should have to live and follow after Jesus Christ in every part of our lives. When we wash one another's feet, we are literally taking the same posture or stance that our Lord and Savior did. Said more simply, when we wash one another's feet, we're just doing what our teacher has showed us to do. So when we wash one another's feet, we are following after the way of Jesus. Just like with, with, with water baptism, the reason that we do it is because we follow the Lord Jesus in obedience. He did these things, so we do these things. The same reason that we take the Lord's Supper. He commanded it to us because that was a form of obedience. The reason that we wash one another's feet is out of obedience to Jesus and a desire to follow after him in every part of our life. So that's why we wash feet. Simply put, we wash feet because it is, it is a way of us showing the world that we are Jesus' disciples and we are going to do just what our teacher did. Second thing that I want us to look at um, what does foot washing symbolize for you and I? So symbols are meant to help us understand things that may be more complicated or really, really big ideas. Symbols help us understand big ideas in really simple ways. I want us to remember that. So what is it that foot washing symbolizes for us? There are multiple things that foot washing symbolizes. The first one is that foot washing reminds us of the grace that God has used to clean us up and to renew us. Let, let's break that down a little bit more. You know, I can only imagine after a long day of walking in a dirt road, your feet were probably, you know, they'd probably be pretty deep, you know, stinky. They might even smell a little bit. They were probably pretty disgusting. That water, that clean water, would be poured on your feet, and the servant would clean your feet, scrub them, make sure they were nice and clean, and then dry them off. It, it was a dirty process for the servant, and the servant would get dirty in cleaning up your dirty feet. But the servant was in a space where that was the servant's job. That's what the servant did. In a very similar manner, we have to look at God's grace kind of being like that water. God pours his grace out on you and I, and he cleans us up. 
That's isn't that what Jesus did? Jesus came into our messy lives, into our sin, into our problems, into all the ways that we fall short, and he poured out the grace of God on us and it cleaned us up. That's part of what foot washing does, is it reminds us that God has poured out his grace on us and he has cleaned us up. The second thing that foot washing symbolizes and this is really, really important. God doesn't just pour out grace on you and I so that we can keep it to ourselves. God pours out his grace on us so that we can then go act gracious to other people and pass it on. Just as we did nothing to earn the grace of God, we are called to extend grace to others, not because they have something that they can give back to us, but because that is what God has done to us, and we are called to then go do that to others. So the second thing that foot washing symbolizes is the life of service that we are called to express to one another. Now here's the thing. It might be easy to show grace to people who are in the church, people who are fellow Christians. But the type of grace that Jesus is calling us to show is grace for people who are both in and outside of the church. Let me say that again. We are called to live a life of service to one another. We are called to help one another. We are called to be there for one another. We are called to be kind to one another. We are called to meet the practical needs of people out there. So if people are hungry, we find ways to feed them. If there's an issue in our community, we try to find a way to solve it. Instead of complaining about the issues in our community, we try to find solutions. That's what it means to live a life of service. We do it because that is what our Lord and Savior showed to us. But one of the things that we must understand in the church is that this life of service and grace that we're called to show to other people is not just for our fellow Christians, but it's for people in and outside of the church. Think about what that could do to, to our neighborhood here in Bartow if we showed Christian grace to every single person that we encounter. Uh, maybe we run into people friends and family that are not believers at Publix, but we show them service. We, we carry their groceries out of the car. We show them grace out of our Christian experience. That makes a, a mark on their lives. Maybe we volunteer our time over at Bartell Elementary School uh, because we're retired and we have that space in our schedule. That small amount of time that we volunteer on a weekly basis, that's a way of us living a life of service, and it makes an impression on people. You see, when we begin to live a life of service towards those who are in the church and outside of the church, that is a powerful, powerful testimony of the goodness of God. So the second thing that, that foot washing symbolizes is the life of service that you and I are called to. Just as Jesus took the position of a servant and washed dirty feet, you and I are called to take the position of a servant and address needs around us. So let's go back to our, our text. Go back, let's go back to John 13 again. And I want us to look at John um, 13. 13 6 John 13 6 so Jesus he's he's begun to wash the disciples feet and I'm sure everybody in the room was wondering what was going on I know the scripture doesn't say that but judging by Simon Peter's response I bet they were all trying to figure out hey this isn't how this is supposed to work the master and the teacher isn't supposed to get down on the dirty ground and wash our dirty feet here's what Simon Peter says he says Lord are you going to wash my feet? In verse 7, Jesus says, You do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. And Peter says this, No, you shall never wash my feet. We have to ask ourselves, why does Peter react in this way? Because Peter, Peter is like, full stop, like, You're not touching my feet, Lord. We're not doing things that way. That's not how things are supposed to work. You are the master and the teacher. If anyone should be washing feet, I should be washing your feet. 
Here's the reason why Simon Peter reacts the way he does. He does it because washing feet was the work of a servant in the ancient Middle Eastern world. The idea, and I said this earlier, that a teacher and master would wash the feet of one of his servants or one of his students was absolutely unthinkable. It, it in many ways, kind of broke the system. It created confusion. It was what you might call countercultural. It, it was so unthinkable that people just didn't know what to do with themselves. Remember that illustration that I, I mentioned earlier where you walk into McDonald's on your lunch break, you're just wanting to grab a Big Mac, and you look up, and, and it's President Obama serving you your Big Mac because he's doing an act of service in the community. That's shocking. You're probably thinking, like, this isn't how things work. Simon Peter has the same reaction. He's like, this isn't how things should work. You're the master and the teacher, and you want to wash my feet? No. Something that we have to understand is that foot washing symbolizes something that is truly unthinkable. And I want us to listen quite carefully here, because this, this is important right here. Foot washing reminds us that a perfect God would forgive broken sinners. Let me say that again. Foot washing reminds us that a perfect God would forgive broken sinners. As my brother-in-law, Pastor Andre Stoudemire, would say, there is a moment where we have to realize that we are imperfect people who are serving a perfect God. But in Jesus, that perfect God, because Jesus is the Son of God, he is fully God. Because Jesus, who is fully God, perfect God, in Jesus, that perfect God serves some imperfect people. Foot washing reminds us that this perfect God came down into our world. He was born into life just like you and us. He walked through the same mess and the challenges that we do, and he got down and he washed broken people's feet. It reminds us that a perfect God came to serve broken sinners. Simply put, foot washing is a reminder that God has done something that is only possible for God to do. Save us. Foot washing also reminds us that you and I are also called to do something that seems impossible. What is that, Pastor? It's this. Serve everyone around us without any conditions. What does that mean? That means whoever we encounter out in the world, whether we like them or we don't, whether they're black or white, whether they're Republican or Democrat, whether they vote like us, whether they think like us, whether they are our enemy or our friend, we are called to serve everyone. Just as Jesus came into the world to serve everyone. That's a part of what it means to be a Christ follower, is we are to do like Jesus and serve everyone. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. In the world that we live in, in the society that we live in, where things have become so divisive, where we can't deal with one another, where some, sometimes people think horrible things of the person who's not just like them, Serving those who are not like you is very challenging. In fact, if we watch the news, we might be convinced that it's not possible to deal with the person who's not like us. It's not possible to, to deal with the person who comes from that other neighborhood who doesn't know my situation. But the reality is that if we follow Jesus, we will follow him into serving everyone. Foot washing reminds us of that. Final thing is, and I'll, and I'll move quickly here. The final thing that we have to ask ourselves is how should foot washing become a way that we live our lives? So from time to time, we're going to, you know, we're going to wash feet in church. We're going to wash feet as a symbol of the grace that God has showed to us and the service that we're called to show to others. We're, we're going to do that. So foot washing may only happen a few times a year. However, however, 
foot washing should be a way in which we live our lives. In other words, foot washing should remind us of how we should live every day. You and I are called to live as people who serve those around us regardless of who they are. Foot washing should remind us of the grace that God has shown to us and the grace that we are to show to others. So how is it that foot washing becomes a way of living our lives? I think it's fairly simple. We should live a life of being willing to serve whoever comes across our path. We should be the first people to lend a helping hand. We should be the first people that when we see a need, rather than gossiping about the problem, we try to find a solution to the problem. We are called to live a lifestyle of service unto God and to other people. John 13, 17, the conclusion of this passage says something really powerful. Jesus says, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. There is a blessing that comes from a posture of service. Another way of saying that is that we can be blessed when we serve others. God will bless us. As you serve people in different ways, one of the things that you find out is sometimes you end up being more blessed than the blessing that you gave to that person. There is a blessing in serving others. When we look at Jesus' life, we see him constantly living a life of service. In some ways, this is one of the main things that Jesus does in his ministry that irritates people. As he doesn't just come to serve those in his own community, but he reaches out and he deals with the Romans. What? He deals with the Romans, the people who have occupied Jerusalem and Israel, uh, that, that, that the Jewish community has been oppressed by. He deals with the enemies. Jesus deals with the lepers, those people who no one wanted to deal with. They didn't want to get sick. Jesus serves them. You see, when we look at the life of Jesus, we constantly see him serving others. And I believe that because Jesus was constantly serving others, we are called to constantly serve others. The principle that we should see in foot washing is that we are called to serve everyone. And this is something that we should live out in our entire lives. Not just on Sunday morning, not just when people are looking, but we should be people who serve one another at all times. Importantly, we must remember that this lifestyle of service that we are called to is meant for everyone, believers and non-believers. I believe that a church that serves its community is a church that is making a difference in its community. It is a church that is evangelizing its communities, spreading the good word, letting people know about Jesus. You see, when we serve people, that is a way of them experiencing Jesus through action, maybe even before they hear about Jesus through our words. Sometimes the most powerful testimony that we can give people about how Jesus has changed us is through the way that we serve people. So as we prepare to conclude this evening, um, one of the things that, that I want us to think about is how exactly can we live out this, this, this truth and this belief that we believe in the washing of the saints' feet? How is it, how is it something that can be meaningful for you and I? The first thing is, um, I want to encourage you that if your church has foot washing ceremonies, participate in them. I know it's different. I know that it's not something that we do day in and day out in 2024. But it is a powerful reminder that you and I need to be reminded that just as our Lord and Savior came to serve everyone, we are called to assume the position of a servant and serve one another. So when foot washing service happens, participate. Second thing is this. We must engage in practical ways of serving people. Foot washing is a reminder of what we are to do. 
So we need to look at ways that we can serve those around us. So maybe that for you is volunteering at a, at a school as a as a lunch as a lunchroom volunteer. You go eat lunch with with the kiddos at one of the local schools, and you, you pour into their lives and you encourage them. That's an act of service. Uh, maybe for you, it's participating in mission work. Maybe you go over to Haiti uh, with um, our, our denomination a few times a year to serve in different ways. Maybe for you, service is uh, helping at a local food bank. Maybe for you, service happens on Sunday morning and you join one of the teams at your church and you serve as an usher or you serve on the worship team. There's so many different ways we can serve one another. Whatever you do, it's important for us to remember that service is a part of the Christian lifestyle. Rather, let me back up. In some ways, you can't have a Christian lifestyle without service. If we become Christians who never serve one another, then we really have to ask ourselves, are we following our Lord and Savior who assumed the position of a servant and washed feet? We are called to wash one another's feet. We're called to a life of service. Well, let's go ahead and conclude and end in prayer. I want to remind you, we have service every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. I would love to see you here. I'd love to welcome you into the NBC family. Come and check us out if you haven't done so. We also are on Facebook Live every Sunday. So if you can't join us in person, please, please join us on per, uh, on, online. We would love to have you. But let's go ahead and pray and close out the evening. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather once again in your name. I pray as we go our separate ways that we'd be reminded that we are called to follow you into a life of service. Lord, I pray that you would create abundant opportunities for us to serve one another, both inside and outside of the church. And Lord, I pray that as we serve one another, Lord, that we would find ourselves drawn closer to you. God, I pray that you protect my friends, keep them healthy, and bring us together once again on Sunday morning. We pray all these things in your name. Amen and amen. You have a wonderful evening.